once again to Hot Fire, the Libertarian TV show. I'm Dr. Steve Finger, and this is the second of uh, the second part of a two-part show tonight with Chris Owens, who's running for Congress to take the place of his father in the 11th Congressional District. Uh, we'd like to remind our viewers once again that we invited all the other candidates, and Chris was the only one who showed up. Uh, we're going to continue now with the issues that we didn't touch on in our last issue, in our last show. Uh, first of all, one of the one of the the uh, issues that have been raised in Congress is that of same-sex marriage. Uh, there's some from some quarters. There's some uh, opposition to uh, to same-sex marriage because there are some people who feel that marriage should be only between a man and a woman. And Chris, I understand you have some feeling about this issue. Yes, thank you, Dr. Finger, for again having me back on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, and I think that it's important that we understand that we're we are today is the result of a series of civil rights evolutions, what I call them. And we went through sort of the end of indentured servitude, we went through the expansion of women's rights, we went through the expansion of civil rights for people of color, and now we're at the point where we have to deal with the expansion and solidification of civil rights for people who love people of the same sex and for economic, the issue of economic class. I feel that we have to support equality in marriage under the law. This does not mean that we shove beliefs down people's throats in churches, that we require churches to marry people of the same sex if that goes against their beliefs. But it does mean that under the you law... Don't you, don't, you don't think we should enforce same-sex marriage? We can't, no. I don't <clears throat> think we can enforce it in the private realm. Mm -hmm. okay. And religion is in the private realm. We have a separation of church and state. But under the law, if two people wish to enjoy the same benefits as people of the opposite sex, then the reality is they should have that right. They should have the right to get married in the fullest sense of the word. That's why I support marriage equality. And when other people have stood against it, such as when the mayor decided that he was going to not support a court decision that allowed that to happen in New York City, I spoke out strongly you know, against that decision because I thought it was hypocritical. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you feel that, that men should have the right to marry other men and women, other women? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, moving on to another topic, the topic of eminent domain has been much in the news lately. Uh, many people realize that in, uh, in Connecticut, in, uh, there was a Kelo case in which the, uh, the, the local uh, uh, city council uh, took over property from an individual to be used for private use. Now, most people realize that the Fifth Amendment grants the government to take uh, property for public use with just compensation. But in this case, uh, the property, uh, land, the many uh, homeowners had their homes taken away and the homes were gonna be used for uh, corporations and for businesses. Uh, and this was upheld by the Supreme Court. And my question to you, Chris, is do you, do you accept the right of a government to take over property of one individual to be used purely for private use by a, by a by another business, if it benefits the uh, the locality, or should uh, eminent domain be exercised only for specifically public use, such as building a highway or a school or something of that nature? Well, I definitely oppose the taking of private property by government to convey it to another private owner. I oppose that unconditionally. I think that that is that is not the way we should be going uh, as a nation. And I think we have to understand the context of the distortion that has taken place, which unfortunately the Supreme Court went along with in the Kelo case that you referred to. The reality is that municipalities are trying to make the argument now that <clears throat> building a tax base is the equivalent of a public good in the same way that building a hospital or building a highway is. And that I think is a fallacy because you can make that justification for anything. You can take anybody's home, you can do anything if you're gonna use that as the justification. We need to focus on building communities, <coughs> excuse me, and building a tax base through economic development that makes sense. And right here in Brooklyn, we have an Atlantic Yards proposal which essentially used the threat of eminent domain taking pri private property and conveying it to another private owner that used that threat to essentially force people out of their homes and their businesses. And that type of threat is not American. It is not the way we should be going. So I do oppose that. Okay, okay. So you feel that eminent domain should be used very sparingly and only for a specifically public purpose, like a highway or a school or something of that nature? Absolutely. Okay, getting on to another subject that we briefly touched on before. We talked about medical marijuana, and you said that you were in favor of the states uh, being able to decide 
that uh, medical marijuana would be acceptable. It wasn't within the purview of the federal government to uh, insist that states uh, outlaw all forms of drugs. Now, in a, in a broader context, uh, uh, do, you, do you believe that the, we have had a drug war in this country for many years? Uh, do you think that drugs in general should be regulated at the, on the federal level or on the state level the way alcohol is? Uh, do you have any feelings as far as the legality or illegality of drugs? Do you think that um, individuals using drugs in their own home and their, their own person should be left alone or should that be, should that be against the law? First of all, let me clarify the medical marijuana position. The question that you had asked me originally last week was a question of do I support the use of marijuana for medical purposes, for, for medicinal purposes. And what I said was that I was inclined to be supportive, but that I was not an expert in the topic, <coughs> so I would reserve judgment until I knew more about it. The, if the issue is whether or not that decision should be left to the states versus the federal government, my position is that the states can make that decision. It is consistent with the, the federal system that we have, that the states can make that system, and I wouldn't oppose that. Uh, when you talk about the issue of drugs, I do not necessarily believe that there should be a license essentially for individuals to use various forms of drugs in their homes unconditionally just because it's in the privacy of their own home. There are narcotics, there are harmful drugs out there. They create harmful effects not just for the individual but they impose on the liberty of others, their family members, their community and the country as a whole. There is a cost. So I definitely do not support, for example, the free use of heroin or, or cocaine or any of those other uh, types of, of drugs simply because someone's using it in their own home. I do believe that those people don't necessarily, if they're victims of their addictions, do not necessarily need to be criminalized in the same way that the drug dealers should be criminalized, but I don't support the use. I see. Should this, be, should this also be left to the states or should this be a, uh, a federal issue? And we had prohibition in this country where alcohol was outlawed by the 18th Amendment. Uh, it became a federal crime, and uh, many years later, the uh, 21st Amendment came and repealed the 18th Amendment, but they didn't make alcohol legal. They just made not a federal issue, but a state issue. It was left to the state, and in fact, as we know, it, up until 1966, alcohol was still illegal in a state like Mississippi. And many people have suggested that uh, we might do the same thing with with uh, narcotics and with dangerous drugs, that rather than it be a federal crime, it be left to the states and let each state decide on its own which, which if any, drugs it would like to criminalize, which it would like to legalize. Would you support something like that, or do you feel this is still within the purview of the federal government to regulate uh, all sorts of recreational drugs? Well, I think, Dr. Finger, that you're raising a very important issue overall that we are going to have to grapple with as a country, and that is, what is the role of federalism in this nation and in our society's future? Whether we look at the issue of voting rights, whether we look at the issue of health care, whether we look at the issue of education, whether we look at many issues, the distinction between that which the federal government has power over and that which the state governments have power over is an important discussion. In this case, because I believe that there is a public health harm that supersedes a whole host of other issues. I have no problem with the prohibitions against certain drug use remaining in force at the federal level. I also believe, for example, that since we have uh, folks who get convicted of crimes in Texas who can never vote again once they're in, in, in jail, and folks in Vermont who get convicted of crimes who can vote from prison, I think we also need a national system to, to make things more uniform when it comes to our voting uh, uh, patterns and our voting behavior and our voting laws as well. But at the same time, there are some things that can be left to the states. Certain things fall out of that discussion. And I think that the harmful effects of narcotics on our society as a whole warrant a national response. Right. Well, of course, we have to separate the harmful effects of the drugs from the harmful effects of the drugs law, drug laws. Uh, some drugs are, are used when they're used appropriately. They're, very, they're, they're quite safe. Uh, when they're illegal, the prices go up. They're contaminated. But, uh, well, but, Dr. Let me, let me ask you this then. I'll ask you the question. Yes. Which of the laws that are, federal, that are considered banned substances by the federal government would you prescribe for your patients? Uh, I will leave it up to my patients. If we're talking about, are you talking about recreational drugs? What recreational would I do as far or as medicinal? Because you said some of, them are, some of them have value. So which one, other than marijuana, which ones would you, would you say I would leave it up to the patient? I would leave it up to the patient. I, if you're talking about recreational drugs, 
uh, drugs so like I think the used, if cocaine is used and it increases the heart rate and increases the chance of heart attack for somebody, you wouldn't tell them to stop using it. I would tell them it? to stop. I would tell them to stop, but I wouldn't put them in jail for for not stopping. Okay. I think that people have the right to do that, and uh, the reason cocaine is so prevalent now is because the enforcement was done so vigorously against heroin, which is actually morphine, which is when used properly, a, very, a relatively safe drug. And what happened was the, the drug enforcement forced up the price of heroin so high that people, would, that people who could have supported a habit by having a menial job were forced into lives of crime to support their habit. Well, now here, here you touch on an issue which also shows some of the differences in the community. There are people who believe, and I'm not necessarily saying I'm one of them, but there are people who believe that the introduction of heroin into African-American and Latino communities during the 50s, the 40s and 50s, led to the decimation of entire generations in poor communities where people became addicted and also unable to function at, at higher levels and higher level jobs in large numbers. And that that has created uh, an effect that has swept through our communities for years and years and years. Every individual might have that right to do that, but there were clearly some social effects of that addiction and of that dependence. Why is it that that's okay to have happen? Well, you have to, I think you have to, again, distinguish between the effects of the drugs and the effects of the laws. One of the reasons that so much decimation occurred in the African-American communities was because the laws were enforced and oftentimes selectively against African-American communities. The prices were raised so that people who could sit home and, and use whatever drug they chose were forced into a life of crime and forced to live like vermin. But heroin, support addiction, their habit. but heroin addiction was not nearly as pre prevalent in terms of the, the incidence of heroin addiction mm -hmm. in white communities, middle class communities, and rich communities as it was in the black community. Well, that, that's, that, that's a choice that people make. I mean, you're saying that the, the white is, people forced black people to use heroin? No, what I'm saying is that the availability... I mean, what's damage, what, that, what, what was, what, in what way was damage done more to the black community, by the heroin itself or by all the, the, the laws that have put such a disproportionate uh, percentage of the black community in jail. There's no question that the enforcement of the laws and the, the large population that we have of African American and, and Latino men and women uh, in our jails has been skewed by drug laws. There's no question about that. Well, but the issue is the drug use that preceded that because we essentially created a situation in this country one way or the other, deliberately or not deliberately, we create a situation where entire communities were decimated by drug use and the enforcement of the laws is essentially the consequence and the after effect of drug use. So why did that drug use take place and why do we have that dependence? Why did we have that dependence on it? I don't necessarily, because of that issue, I'm not, I don't expect you to answer that, mm -hmm. but because of that issue I cannot support a policy that allows people to just freely use drugs that have, have such a devastating effect on an economy, on a future of an entire group of people. I think, you're, I, I think you're looking at a very artificial situation because you're seeing the way drugs were used in the context of their being illegal. If the drugs were clean, if the dosage was regulated, if the people did not have to share needles because it was illegal to purchase needles, I don't think you would see the spread of AIDS that we have now, which is basically uh, because of the laws against, against purchasing individual, purchasing clean, sterile needles. Uh, this was clearly from the, from the law. There's nothing in, uh, in heroin that causes AIDS. It's sharing the needle that causes AIDS and hepatitis and all the other diseases. And that's what de what's decimated the community. People can use drugs safely. There are many people now who use heroin recreationally, the same way they use alcohol, and they live normal lives. It's when the laws are enforced against these people and they start off life with a prison record that the problem becomes so, so uh, overwhelming. Well, I think we just have a fundamental disagreement on that point. Okay. Anyway, moving on, moving on to um, some of the other things that we haven't yet discussed. Uh, uh, the welfare program in this country has, uh, um, has, has gotten out of hand for many years. Uh, welfare reform in 96 allowed states to a, a great, much greater leeway than they had in the past to regulate the use of welfare in the, in the, in the states. One of the things that was allowed by this law would be family caps, where uh, women who had children out of wedlock, single women had children, uh, and continued to have children, used to get grants each year, each time they had another child. The new law allowed states to place a cap 
on the amount they got so that if women had additional children, they would not get additional funds. Would you support a cap like that? Would you support uh, a, a single woman having one child getting a certain amount? If she has a second kid, they don't get any more money for that. I think that's a complicated issue. And the reason why I think it's a complicated issue is because if we're going to talk about welfare mm -hmm. in that context, we need to also talk about Medicaid in that context. We need to talk about a variety of other programs that are made available uh, to people because they have children or because they need, have certain needs that the public has a responsibility for in one form or another. Um, I have a hard time supporting CAPS. I also understand the rationale behind the CAP. Uh, I believe very firmly that the key to ending people's dependence on welfare is to provide a good education and to provide good job opportunities and to provide affordable daycare so that children are taken care of and people don't feel like they're in a position where they have to stay home. And some may choose to stay home. That's a different issue. But if they choose to stay home and they can work out of their home or they have the economic support, that's fine. But if they have the ability to work and want to work, then they should be able to work and they should be able to have affordable daycare. All those issues have to be addressed if you talk about caps on any kind of benefit. And by the same token, we have to look at families where people have 8 to 12 children because it is part of their cultural belief. And we have to <coughs> say, well, if we're putting caps over here, does that mean we're also going to put caps on the medical benefits that families with large children who are living under the poverty line are going to receive as well? Are those children not entitled to receive medical care through the Medicaid system because they choose to have a lot of children? I don't think that's a debate we want to get into. Are you talking about people who are self-supporting but are on but are getting, purchasing health insurance on their own? No, I'm talking about people who are self-supporting. But get Medicaid. In, in the sense that they, they, the family income may be lower than $30,000. And they you get got twelve kids. You get right. 12 kids. Right. The kids are entitled to Medicaid benefits based on the income level. Right. And the question, they're getting Medicaid benefits, which is a form of support. Mm -hmm. Are we willing to get into a discussion about cutting off medical benefits for large families with large children? Is that something that you favor? Uh, I don't think so. What, what about? Because I don't think children should be penalized. Right. And that's essentially what CAPS do. They penalize children. Right. You know, they may disincentivize the, the parents from having more children, but Correct. in the end, children get penalized. So I have a real problem with Do you with believe that it disincentivizes? Do you believe that, that, that women, like men, make rational choices, and if they are not going to get more money for having more children, that they might stop having additional children, or do you think that's irrelevant? I think women always make rational choices. I don't think it's a matter of whether it's like us or not like us, but right. I think they always make rational choices. So then, so it, then, but always yes. make rational choices, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the choice to have children isn't a rational, to have more children isn't a rational choice, it, or to have less children isn't a rational choice. I think there's just so many factors involved with whether or not people have children that are ec socioeconomic and based on education and other right. issues that we cannot sit and say very easily that yes, a cap is going to do this or a cap is not going to do that. That is assuming that all people behave in a certain economic model mm -hmm. and it is a philosophy that I don't I don't agree with because I don't treat people simply as economic actors. I treat people as people. Yeah, right. So then, but uh, uh, the question then is, do you support caps? Would you, if a, char if a woman has one child and then has an additional child and an additional, should she get extra welfare for each child or should I, this be capped at a certain amount? I, the, the short answer is <clears throat> I lean against caps because I don't want to penalize children. So they should get, each child she gets, she should get a raise in her welfare benefits. I believe the children should benefit. I don't know how that should be executed. But the question is, the law allows allows the states to cut off uh, welfare benefits for each additional and child. And I don't. So I they don't should get. That. They should. Do you feel that if they were to do that, women would have less children, or they it would not affect it at all? You don't, don't have know. any opinion about. I don't that. know okay. what the. In all honesty, I don't know what the results of the '96 law have been right. in terms of the behavior of, of population growth. Mm -hmm. I've seen other studies about other issues, but I've not seen anything that said point blank that ca that any sort of caps has led to a decrease in the number of children based on what was projected before. Right. So I'd have to look at all the, the numbers. I don't, I don't but I'm, really know. I'm inclined against it simply because I see it as penalizing children. Right. So you feel that, that if they have more children, they should just get more money for that. Okay. That was I my question. I feel the children should the children have should the resources get more money. they need to live a healthy and productive okay. life. Okay. Okay.
I don't think we should phrase it as they should get the mother should get more money. I think we should phrase it and view it as the children need the resources to live a healthy right. and productive life. Right. How they get there is a management issue that we can discuss, whether or not the mother should be in charge or the father should be in charge or someone else should be in charge, but I don't necessarily believe children should be penalized. Okay, okay. Um, moving on to health care, I know that's something that you're very interested in. Uh, one of the proposals that have been made to decrease the cost of health insurance is that states should not be permitted to prohibit their citizens from buying insurance from another state. As it stands now, if you live in New York, you have to buy insurance in, in, that's from a New York health insurance uh, company, and that gives the legislature in each state the right to impose all sorts of mandates on those insurance to, to require that, for instance, some states require alternative medicine to be covered, others require chiropractic or psychiatric care to be covered. And uh, one of the proposals that's been put forward to lower the cost of health insurance is to allow uh, a, an individual in one state to purchase health insurance in any state so that they could go to a state where the health insurance were cheaper and where less, less coverage was altered, give people a choice. Would you, would you be in favor of allowing individuals to buy health insurance from another state where it might be cheaper and there might be, might be more restricted? Well, I think, the, <clears throat> first of all, when you talk about insurance, you know, insurance is based on various pools. Mm -hmm. And what is cheaper over here today could quickly become more expensive if the nature of the pool changes. The rates are based on the profile of the population that an insurance company has put together. So the belief that you're going to get something cheaper, I think, is a false belief because once there's demand and people start buying in that other area, the price is going to go up. However, more importantly, I do not support the existence of a 50-state solution to health care. I support universal health coverage through a national health insurance plan. And that national health insurance plan should be comprehensive and all-inclusive and give people the opportunity to get all of their issues addressed through a single-payer, low-cost plan. And that means essentially subsidizing how, health care. How would you make it low-cost? Well, it should be as low cost as we can make it. I don't know. I don't know what the figures would actually be. How would how would, so. cost, how would it be cheap? How would it be lower cost than what we have now? Well, I think where that, would the savings come from? I th I, th I think, frankly, that the biggest savings would be through preventive health. The reality is that in the uninsured populations, in particular, but certainly in all the the lower economic level uh, populations that we deal with, and I, I know this from my experience dealing with Medicaid populations, the biggest battle that we have is to get people to go to the doctor rather than using the emergency room, which is much more expensive. Mm -hmm. If you get people to the doctor ahead of time and you get your diabetes diagnosed and your hypertension diagnosed and and the other issues, and you put a preventive uh, plan in a treatment plan in place, then you, you definitely have savings and you definitely reduce overall health care costs. Now, the other specialty items or, or some of the higher cost items, those costs may not necessarily go down. I don't know all the economics specifically, but I know that with 40 million uninsured in the country, the cost of those 40 million when they go to the emergency room is far greater than it would be if we were able to reach people. If it doesn't cost them a lot of money to go to the doctor, they'll go to the doctor and therefore their issues will be addressed. So that's where I believe there will be immediate cost savings. So it'll be costed by extending the medical medical insurance to everybody in the country. The prices will go down because people will will take care of their problems sooner. We will we will increase prevent the use of preventive health as a way of avoiding higher costs. Yes. Okay. Okay. And that will bring the cost down. Well, that that was what they did in Massachusetts, as they insisted well, that everybody have health insurance. I think that's what they're trying to do. We'll, we'll, we ho I hope it works. I'll give I'll right. give the Republican governor credit if it actually works. Right. Uh, of course, that when Medicare came into effect, when Medicare was uh, was first proposed, it was supposed to make the care much cheaper, and obviously the, the prices were five times what the estimates were. Well, I think that one of the problems we have, frankly, with our health system in this country is that we have a lot of private health insurance companies involved that drive up all kinds of costs, including very specifically the malpractice costs to providers. I think that one of the issues we have not addressed in this country is why malpractice insurance is so high for providers when the real culprits are the health insurance companies that set those rates. And I think that's the Wait, that's The health the insurance issue. companies set the malpractice rates? The, the, I'm sorry, the insurance companies, that, the malpractice insurance companies that deal with the insurance set those rates. And that's what we should be addressing because that is an artificial inflator of costs. You think that, the, that these companies are making extortionate amounts of money? I, I, I definitely believe that those companies are making 
way too much money. And that increases the cost to everybody, particularly to the providers. And it has driven high-risk providers out of business in many areas, particularly in the OBGYN areas. I think it's because the, there are so many suits. No, and there the are not so many so suits. And no, we're, we're not, we're not going to go into that I think they're just, racing, they're just raising the 3 rates? 3% of the costs are related to legal costs. So that, that is a totally specious argument that and the Republicans have made 97% goes where? The 97% the, the is based on the, the insurance premium calculations that are based on all kinds of other issues, those lawsuits are not the driving force. They are not the driving cost. You know, there are a lot of insurance companies who are going out of the business. If it's as profitable as you seem to be implying, why are they, why are they giving up the malpractice business if they can make this killing well, of extortion I, I, prices? I didn't, I didn't know that, and, and I'd be happy to look more at right. that information. All right, okay. Um, now, <clears throat> okay, it looks like we've covered pretty much most of the things that we wanted to cover. Uh, we're winding down here. I, I just like, just, just briefly, I want to touch on one more thing here. Um, what would you, the, since the, this, um, the economy is so poor in many of the minority districts, what would you do to, in, to encourage businesses to come into those areas? Would you, do you favor a special minimum wage or any tax relief in those areas? Absolutely. I believe firmly in small businesses as the engines of growth and of the engines of community development in the larger sense of the word. I have already proposed that all businesses who gross $1 million or less should be totally tax exempt at the federal level and that there should also be some special portable, what I call portable deduction provisions for companies that cross that $1 million to $2 million uh, threshold so that they can still use some of the deductions they would have lost during their What about the minimum dollars. wage? Should there be a lower I minimum the, wage in those areas? No, the minimum wage should be, incre should be increased. I am not in favor of lowering minimum increase. wages. Okay, looks like we're, we've just about run out of time. I know you wanted to make a brief closing statement, so well, Chris, thank, you. thank you very much for coming here. And uh, Well, thank you very much, and, and thank you all for watching. Uh, my name is Chris Owens. I'm running for Congress in the 11th Congressional District. I believe I'm the best candidate. I believe I'm totally qualified. I've worked in the public sector, the private sector, and the nonprofit sector. I've been involved with this community, lived in all parts of the community. I am a progressive Democrat. I am committed to making change that we need to make in Washington and fighting the Republicans. I'm endorsed by Congress member John Lewis, John Conyers, Maxine Waters, and others. And I hope you visit my website, which is www.voteowens.com. Thank you very much. Okay, once again, Chris, thanks very much for coming to the show and to our audience. Thank you very much for coming to watch our uh, hot fire libertarian television. And we hope you'll tune in next week for another exciting episode of Hot Fire Libertarian TV.